So instead of talking about the book, The Power of Moments, I wanted to present this to you from a slightly different perspective and the, through the lens of the work of a researcher I've used a great deal in my lectures from NYU and Cornell, uh, BJ Fogg. And BJ Fogg uh, created the Persuasive Technology Laboratory at Stanford University. And he coined the term persuasive technology in a book by that name in 2003, which I highly recommend, even though it's a 2003 book, it predicted a lot of the things that digital social media currently do and that we use today as ways of persuading users on digital platforms to do what we want them to do. So a lot of it applies. A lot of it applies to mobile. And it was written in 2003 at a time when mobile uh, wasn't really even what we know it to be today. Smartphones weren't even really what we, we know them to be today. So BJ Fogg is one of my favorite um, uh, persuasive technology uh, theorists. And this, this is a, a kind of a brief overview of, of the way he frames this. And it relates too to the idea of the power of moments. And you can think about that as we go through this lecture. Um, and, and Fogg argues that computers do all kinds of things for us now, things that we never imagined they would do from ordering food to designing products for us, uh, deciding who we should date. Uh, they are just our best friends and uh, we're persuaded to make decisions by the technology itself, sometimes persuaded to use the technology by the technology itself. Uh, so persuasive technology doesn't necessarily always mean uh, that the technology is doing the persuading. Sometimes there are users or designers behind that technology, as we talked about in the lecture about human computer interaction, the idea of affordances, the idea of a designer's deputy that the designer creates an entity in, in, the, in the digital media experience that tells the user what to do. Um, but what persuasive technology is really working to do is changing attitudes or behaviors of users through persuasion. And look at this early Facebook, early Facebook and, and modern Facebook, and, and you know, not, not quite so modern, a little old here, but uh, it's evolved. It's evolved to be more persuasive it's evolved to showcase social content. It's evolved in ways that have captured user attention in ways that basically feed the algorithm as we know, as we talked about in this class. Um, can you believe there was a time when your mobile phone number was one of the top things that appeared on your Facebook profile? Can you imagine today if that was, you know, the Facebook profiles of today are used very differently than the Facebook profiles uh, uh, that we saw in the past, but the, the idea of persuasion has pervaded this tool. Um, Fogg talks about persuasive technology and, and, and the way it operates in terms of a functional triad, three bullets. And they encompass captology. Captology is the term Fogg uses for persuasive technology. I think it's kind of gimmicky. I prefer saying persuasive technology. He says captology. But this framework of a functional triad um, illustrates the different roles technology can play. So think about Facebook and the role it plays in these ways as a tool, as a social actor, and as a medium itself. So as a tool, enhancing the human ability, Zuckerberg's vision of connecting the universe in ways that make us all very happy, a tool, uh, but also uh, Facebook as a social actor, as a connector of individuals and ideas and thoughts and groups and creating relationships, romantic relationships, monetary relationships, transactional relationships. And then finally, Facebook or any computer as a persuasive medium. We spent time last class talking about Marshall McLuhan. I think some of you really enjoyed that. The medium is the message, but the idea of the experience provided by the tool. So that is basically what Instagram is about. That's what Snapchat is about. That's what many of these digital platforms are about. It's the medium, Twitter, uh, and how that shapes the message. So these three vertices of the triad are in essence, how digital social media acts persuasively on individuals. Now, it's most interesting to me, I think we understand the medium vertices and the social actor vertices from what we've talked about in class a lot. I want to zero in on the tool one because I think it's an interesting one to think about how even using social media as a tool can act on us persuasively. You hear a lot of folks will say, well, I'll only use Facebook to look at other people's Facebook profiles. I'm not actually going to use Facebook. I'm just going to use it as a tool. I'm not going to create an account. 
it's interesting when you think about what computers do as tools. There's really only two things a computer can do as a tool. Any computer can store data and perform calculations. That's it. Calculators can do that. Um, and that's, that's what Facebook is doing. That's what everything we're using in digital social media is doing, these two functions. Um, but it's incredibly persuasive the way they can do it. They can do it in ways that humans cannot. They can do it in ways that can uh, create human decision-making shape behavior. For example, storing massive data sets, having access to historical records over vast periods of time, being able to slice those with a, a pivot table in Excel can be incredibly persuasive. And folks will use that in presentations and in, in, in uh, budget decisions all the time. Same thing with making calculations, instantaneous decision support tools, being able to make calculations and predictive analysis so easy that you don't need graph paper and all those calculations. You can just plug in numbers into a tool and make decisions or persuade your boss to make decisions. The ways that we are persuaded by technology beyond digital social media, if you just look at devices, if we, if we take a look at the way devices persuade us, every moment of every day, devices persuade us to make decisions based on the data they give us and the way they persuade, they give us that data. Um, somebody reading a book that has poor eyesight is not going to get the same messages and the same ideas as somebody reading a Kindle who can adjust the size of the text and view it however they want. The experience created by these technologies persuades the user to make decisions and influences their behavior in ways they aren't even aware of. Um, compulsive behaviors, uh, dopamine related behaviors we're aware of based on, on tapping and the amount of joy we get from tapping. But these tools are designed to change attitudes or behaviors because they're making that outcome easier or quicker or, or more efficient to achieve. Now, how are they persuasive? Ease of outcome is definitely one of the ways that, that we'll look at that. The easiest way that digital social media can make things uh, uh, persuasive is to make them easier. Reduce the amount of time it takes. I can tweet something out and get a result. Um, so that reduction technology, that's one. Uh, leading people through a process, that's another. I will talk about that in a moment, tunneling folks down pathway. Um, it's really interesting. I'll, I'll touch on this on a second. Um, but when you look at most digital social media platforms, the way you go through the account creation process, the end of that process is often adding followers. It is often the very construction of the network that you are joining. So sometimes the tools and technology that lead you through a process like an installation process seems very benign, set your account up in fact is leading you to make persuasive decisions. Finally, performing calculations or measurements that motivate, I talked a bit about those before. Those are the base things computers have done for centuries or yeah, well, decades for sure. Um, and I think that there are real advantages to visualization technologies and decision support tools that will show you really fancy graphs of what if scenarios, if I put my million dollars in marketing here or there, what should I do? Boy, does that change behavior. If I can have a computer perform a calculation and show me a pretty graph that says what I should do with my money. Um, but there are a lot of types of tools. How do you parse them? I wanna give you a taxonomy from, from FOG and really focus on that for the rest of this lecture and then let you go. Um, so, uh, there are seven types of persuasive tools that I want to, and you're going to recognize these um, as I talk about them. Reduction, which I started to talk about a bit already. Tunneling, which has nothing to do with digging, uh, but uh, I already mentioned as well, has a bit to do with directing your attention during the installation process. Um, similar tailoring, which I'll talk about, um, not bespoke. Um, Self-monitoring and suggestion are kind of related as our surveillance and conditioning. And uh, these kind of range from the benign to the I'm not sure so benign, uh, because often when people see surveillance and conditioning, they go, what are we talking about here? What does this mean? Uh, tailoring and suggesting sounds much nicer and reduction. I think it makes things easier, but conditioning and surveillance. Tell me more about these things. We'll get to that. Let's start with the first one, reduction, making things easier. 
what could be better than that? Making things easier. Um, I want you to think about the ethical concerns behind every single one of these, because every single one of these has ethical problems with it. If done incorrectly, you can really do problems with reduction. Um, when you make things too easy, um, I won't ask, because we're virtual, unfortunately, it kind of reduces us. I'd ask for a show of hands of how many times people here have bought something they didn't mean to buy on Amazon because it was just too easy to click and buy it, or you didn't realize you bought two of it uh, because you were on, you were checking out, you weren't checking uh, what was in your cart. Sometimes uh, a reduction strategy, which is really just designed to make a, a behavior easier, is really designed to increase the, the perceived benefit cost ratio. To, to get the user more engaged, say, well, you could do more of this. Um, it's not just to make it simpler, like we know you can check out of a store, we've seen you use your credit card before. But if we make it really easy for you to use your credit card, then, well, you might use it more. That's the idea behind a reduction strategy. So if you make sharing content easier, if you make following content easier, uh, make, make sure you subscribe, you know, all of those tactics are designed really to increase the perceived benefit cost ratio for the user and also make things easier for them absolutely but sometimes they're really cheats they're not necessarily things they were problems before like the idea of buying something immediately buying something immediately wasn't a problem we needed solving it it wasn't there was nobody sitting around going gosh what if i could buy more faster wouldn't that be something it, it was actually designed to make it seem like that's a benefit most people think of that as one click shopping is what a benefit to me it's so much simpler and easier all it means is you've given the technology control over certain processes and you're comfortable making it that simple for you to spend that much money and click twice accidentally we've all made that mistake unfortunately um, but that kind of reduction technology is very powerful it creates an immediate benefit in the mind of the user it says wow I have a secret way of doing this that other people don't have. How cool. Similar to tunneling technology. Again, not about building a tunnel. I just have a picture of a tunnel here. Um, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. This is how you guide a user through an experience or process. The setup or installation process is the one I like to use here. It's the easiest one for everyone to understand. Everyone has created a new account on digital social media before. Everyone has been confused by creating that account and had to uh, you know, or help their parents to do it, or help an older relative to do it. If you've ever had to help an older relative to do anything on their computer, you understand the value of tunneling technology. Uh, because you're exposing someone to unknown information. There, that is sort of the metaphor here. The metaphor of a tunnel means you're guiding a, a user down a pathway into darkness. They don't really know where they're going. They just trust that someone put these tracks in the right place, and they're going to end up at their destination. And, and, and tunneling technology Again, thinking about the ethics behind this, um, you, you could do a lot of damage. What if you just had those tracks go right off into an abyss and everybody who takes a train down there dies a horrible death? Uh, that's awful, no. Uh, um, we assume good intentions. We assume tunneling technology is made effective because it's helping the user more easily go through a process. Should I make this decision? Should I make that decision? Here's Mr. Burns trying to decide which ketchup to buy. Um, it helps the designer to control the user experience. We talked about the designer's deputy in our lecture about human computer interaction and affordances. This is where that would come in. The designer's deputy is the, the hey, I see you're trying to install a program. I think you should do this. And people value that consistency. They like that reassurance. Um, we also talked about that in that lecture that human beings like to have reasons why they're doing things. Would you like the custom installation or the standard installation? The more choice we have, the less likely we are to be content with our decision, which is why everyone picks the standard installation. <laughs> if you pick the custom installation, maybe you have specific ideas in mind. Uh, maybe you enjoy uh, learning new things. You, you, you're usually um, an early adopter or part of the very ends of the bell curve. And most folks will pick uh, the, 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 the standard option. Um, that's why when you're offered a small, medium, or large, lots of people say medium. <laughs> I like the middle option where I can be content with my decision. Um, also helping folks make the right decisions. Sometimes it would be very confusing to have to make a custom choice. 
The Town of Line technology helps a novice user not be confused or get bogged down in the details by trusting the process. Uh, I mentioned you can see this in installations all the time. Uh, software installations make use of this because you can do a lot of damage to your system if you try to do that custom installation and you don't know what you're doing. Um, they also want the user to successfully get to a place where the technology will work. It's a deployment. So sometimes the, the reason you're using tunneling technology, um, potentially in a digital social media experience, is you want to get the user to make an action. You need to get them to an action point. In order to get them to an action point, you need to draw their attention down a path. Uh, that's what tunneling technology is for. You see this um, uh, in a lot of cases with uh, uh, any kind of setup with a digital social media platform. Sometimes you see it with joining groups or um, uh, various applications within platforms, um, sometimes as a way to collect data. I'll get back to that. I'll get back to it right here, actually. Here's an ancient version of Twitter. <laughs> And uh, when you sign up for Twitter, even back then, it recommends to you people to follow. And it asks you for your interests. The tunneling technology has taken you through the, the account setup process and is now into the data mining process. And because you're a new user, it doesn't have much data to mine on you. So its priority is to get as much data about you as possible. Follow some people and tell me some things you like so the algorithm can start to work on you. Is that part of the setup process? Yeah, I mean, if you want to really enjoy the benefits of Twitter's algorithm, is it necessary for your platform or for your profile? Not so sure. Is it ethical? Does the user really know what they're doing when they do this? Who's to say? Same thing with tunneling, or when you think about tunneling technology from a, 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 one more thing about tunneling technology, when you think about it finally from an ethical perspective, summing up, personal information can be exchanged. The user may end up doing things they don't understand that they're doing. They may get forced to do something they don't want to do. And that's why usually in a lot of setup, like installation packages for software, they're really good about putting a big red button that says exit. So are you sure you want to exit? Yes, I want to exit. <laughs> Because you need to give people a parachute, like an escape hatch with tunneling technology. When they decide they don't trust the process anymore or they're scared, they need to escape. They feel like they're being manipulated. Same thing with tailoring technology. That was the next one I want to talk about. And it is uh, the idea that the product doesn't change, but the presentation does to suit the user. This is where uh, geolocation tokenizing would come into play. The idea that that car there is as appealing to the two silhouettes because the silhouette on the left prefers the black version with the stripes and the silhouette on the right prefers the pink version. Uh, but it's the same product, but by tailoring it to the user, we've made it more appealing and we can see how that might work in certain digital social media. We can see how uh, certain hashtags that can be followed. We can see how uh, the presentation of content in certain ways uh, leveraging certain platforms can be used to tailor content. Um, this is the customization process. It enhances the precognition of your users. Users actually think they're having a better experience when they think they're having a customized experience. If they're having a custom, if they think there's some customization involved in the user experience they're having in your digital social media platform, they'll perceive it as more relevant and credible. Um, and they're more likely to share it. This is your personalized recommendation. And they want to share it. Now, you can imagine from an ethics standpoint how this might backfire. Uh, because if you're recommended things that have absolutely nothing to do with what you bought, you might assume ill practices here. Um, on the other hand, uh, unfortunately, this is uh, covering, but um, if it's a spot on, uh, recommendation, it's tailoring something, you might really like it this way, you might really trust this. So the bottom line is that personalization needs to be real. You see this with videos as well, more and more. Um, personalized journeys or personalized communications that are really just an example of, look how much of your data we've mined and we can use it to put in the video for 
Burger King or American Express that talks about your personal likes or your location where you do most of your shopping. Because we have that information and we can use it to entice you. And it, ironically, it's just a demonstration of what Marshall McLuhan was talking about, which is the complete disregard of privacy. <laughs> Here's here's a video that you can play talking about how much Burger King you eat and and where you live and and what you like to order at Burger King. Um, or I got a video in my inbox from American Express that was exciting. Congratulations. What, what year we've had. It was an end of year summary and personalized video for you. And you 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 shopped this many places and did this many things. I'm like, I don't want to know this. I don't want anyone to know these things about me. But for others, I might think, wow, gosh, this is really interesting, tailored videos for me. It really explains a lot. Um, so the mere perception of tailoring works, that's the ethical problem. If you just tell a user this is customized for you, you're more likely to persuade them. That's a sales gimmick. You can cheat users with fake customization. It happens all the time. It's unfortunate, and I'm not teaching you to do that. <laughs> But I am saying that it's one of the ethical concerns of saying you're customizing when, in fact, you're just giving them the version everybody gets. Um, it also runs into privacy concerns. Um, maybe I don't want people to know that I like pink cars. Or maybe I don't want the artificial intelligence making assumptions based on machine learning based on my data. Uh, it could be a violation of GDPR. It could be a violation of California data privacy rules. We've talked about these. This is where we're going, folks, though. I mean, of all of the ones I'm going to talk about tonight, tailoring technology is the one that you should spend the most time thinking about for the future of your digital social media career. Um, the idea of just in time information delivered by an algorithm based on your mood, your behavior, your status, what you've been posting, what you like. Um, this is what the algorithms are seeking to do. So I would say of all the methods of persuasive technology that Fogg wrote about way back in 2003, this is where in 2022, digital social media algorithms are spending the most time um, figuring out how to customize content to make you feel like everything you're experiencing is individual when in fact it's mass produced. Um, it relates to the idea of suggestion technology, going back to a, a slide I showed you earlier, it looked like Amazon. But the idea of suggesting at the right time, the timing of suggestion technology is sometimes more critical than the data behind the suggestion. Um, you may know that somebody is interested in buying a ring, uh, but you may not know when the best time to get them to do that is. Maybe you have data that tells them when it tells you when their geolocation is close to a jewelry store and you deliver them that data. Um, maybe you want to make sure it's the right time of day. Um, maybe there are bad, and there are, by the way, bad times of day to deliver suggestions on purchasing things. That's why you don't at six in the morning get purchase suggestions. Um, that's why at certain uh, 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 times, your financial situation or your location or your state of mind may impact the kinds of suggestions you get by algorithms. Um, other times, it's scary how good these can be that because of various data sources and you swear that your smart device is listening to you, you're flipping through digital social media and all of a sudden there's an ad for something you were talking to somebody over lunch about. That is suggestion technology at its best. But it doesn't have to be so sophisticated. All we're trying to do with suggestion technology is alter behavior. It might be about buying a product. It might be about wearing a mask. It might be about sanitizing your hands. Why do you think hand sanitizers are placed outside of doors? It's a suggestion. Use the hand sanitizer before you touch this door. Just like my favorite suggestion technology, this thing. This thing is the, the easiest. It doesn't do anything but shoot a radar beam at your car and tell you how fast you're going. Like you need that. You have a dial in your car that tells you how fast you're going. But what's above it? A static sign reminding you of the speed limit. So all it's doing is at the right moment, the moment you're driving by, it's presenting you two pieces of data, a static piece of data and a dynamic piece of data. And if it does it at the right moment, 
It's trying to influence your behavior. This to me is the best example of suggestion technology and how you can replicate it in digital social media. If you can create a speeding sign for, for uh, users. This is also uh, behind the idea of self-monitoring technology. This is self-monitoring. The difference between this and the one in your car, the one in your car is self-monitoring technology. This is suggestion technology. We'll talk about self-monitoring technology in just a moment. But suggestion technology, again, is about time. That's the difference between tailoring technology, giving folks customization, and suggestion technology, which is timing, timing, timing. No coupon is forever, right? No coupon is in for whenever you want to use this coupon, you can use the coupon. Never. There's always a time limit because they want that to be a timely suggestion of a purchase and they give you a discount based on that timely suggestion. If any of you shop at CVS, which is a great store, uh, and you sign up for their rewards program with your phone number, um, they will give you coupons every time you check out um, from one of their uh, registers. Almost like a scarf of coupons, a ream of coupons will come out. Most of them only good for a few days, but all designed to suggest that you buy something you probably already have or don't necessarily need to buy yet, but they'd like you to buy now. Suggestion technology is all about timing, 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 timing. Similar to self-monitoring technology, which again, at the time Fogg wrote this in 2003, there were no Fitbits. There were no smartphones managing your steps. Uh, this was all about the idea of ways of monitoring oneself. And there were various devices to do that, but nothing like the way mobile devices have taken this. Self-monitoring technology providing you ongoing physical geolocation, heartbeat, health information. And, and now we know today how big health tech is as an industry and how many digital social media platforms are trying to find ways to integrate health tech into what they're doing. Um, trying to give people a better self-awareness and self-understanding. This is before smart devices even had the idea of telling you how much screen time you were using. That's another self-monitoring technology, allowing you to monitor yourself, to modify your own behavior, to maybe use the device less. But you can think about lots of ways we use self-monitoring technology for fitness, for health, uh, for timing. If any of you have an alarm on your phone for any reason, you have self-monitoring technology. That's what an alarm is. If you have an alarm clock, that's self-monitoring technology. Um, if you have a smoke detector in your home, and I hope you do, that's self-monitoring technology. Please, technology, save me from myself because I'm a human and I make poor choices and I need you to help me manage those choices. Um, you can think about again how ethics play into this. Um, you might think about the ways this could be abused, um, the ways that the data that is being collected to help you self-monitor might be sent to third parties, either to market products to you or to target you for various kinds of messages. Uh, where that comes into play is as we slide into the deeper, darker side of the persuasive ladder towards surveillance technology, which of course can be very persuasive. Um, sometimes only because people know there is surveillance. So what is surveillance? One party monitoring the behavior of another. And again, Marshall McLuhan talked about this last week in the video we watched, but the idea that it is an entire industry in mankind right now to monitor other human beings and record in detail what they're doing. We have technology to do it, analytics technology running all the time. Um, mon employers are monitoring their employees in all kinds of ways, keystroke technology on everyone's computers working from home. Um, I even read a story about a company that required all employees to have their webcams on all the time, whether they were in a meeting or not, whether they were at their desk or not. I mean, can you imagine the invasion of privacy that you have to have a camera on all the time, whether you're sitting at your desk or not? Um, government monitoring citizens, every government does. 
parents with baby with not only the teenagers but baby monitors baby monitors this has been a boom in baby monitors and the technology we have for watching babies and watching old people with little cameras everyone has a ring on their their door where they're monitoring everybody walking past their front door um, so we have these surveillance technologies why is that persuasive why is it persuasive well it has a powerful effect on the way people behave if they know about it they have to know about it. The problem with some surveillance is that it's so covert, people don't realize they're being surveilled. And that is unfortunate because human beings change their behavior constantly when they think they're being watched. When people think they're on camera or they think there's a surveillance camera, they act very appropriately. They adhere to rules. Uh, they try to meet observer expectations. Maybe they'll even you know, cheat to the camera to make sure the camera can see they're doing the right thing because they think somebody is watching. It's public compliance without private acceptance. You have to think about that. Public compliance. In public, I'm going to do this without private acceptance. In private, I don't agree with this. I just don't be watched. Powerfully persuasive, though, because it gets the desired behavior. So it speaks to the idea of operant conditioning. This is how we get past the idea of folks just doing things uh, uh, for the sake of being surveilled, but the idea that they'll do them no matter what. Um, you, you may have heard the idea of uh, Pavlov's dog, the famous experiment where Pavlov would ring a bell, and because the sound of the bell was associated by the dog with eating, the dog would begin to salivate every time it heard the ring of the bell. This is conditioning, and B.F. Skinner, the famed psychologist, talks about operant conditioning. And in this uh, case, you're talking about with mice, uh, it's not with digital social media, but I'm gonna play a little bit of this so you hear uh, a bit about conditioning uh, to get a change in behavior. Can pigeons read? This one gives every indication because he's been taught to distinguish between two words and to behave appropriately. He's learned his different response to each sign by being rewarded with food. So the bird isn't acting independently. Its behavior is shaped by controlling its environment. The first task was to isolate an individual piece of behavior and see how that could be changed. Skinner did this by keeping individual pigeons at about three quarters of their normal weight so that the birds were always hungry and food could be used as an automatic reward. The pigeon was studied in a uniform box, one it quickly grew used to. One piece of behavior, pecking a colored disc, was measured on a graph. Pigeon learned that pecking the disc produced a reward. Then the behavior of pecking could be studied in relation to how often that reward was offered. Kind of like tapping on a smart device. Or in Skinner's terms, what was the schedule of reinforcement? The main thing is what, what we call schedules of reinforcement. Reinforcement is what the layman calls reward, and you can schedule it uh, so that a reward occurs every now and then when a pigeon does something. We usually use a response with a pigeon pecking a little disc a little spot on the wall and you can reinforce with food but you don't reinforce every time you have perhaps every tenth time or perhaps only once every minute or something like that there are a very large number of, of schedules and they have their uh, special effects and there is a good example of how you can move from uh, the uh, the pigeon to the human case because one of the one of the schedules which is very effective with, with rats or pigeons is what we call the variable ratio schedule and that is at the heart of all gambling devices and has the same effect the pigeon can become a pathological gambler just as a person can now so they trained the pigeon to basically get addicted to pecking on the thing the same way an addicted gambler would get to using a slot machine so think about that in terms of technology and the way we tap on digital social media and the dopamine released in the brain every time we see a like very uh, interesting and potentially scary. Um, let's move away from the scary for a second and to, to the less scary. Uh, 
the right persuasive tools has to be picked for the right job. I'm not suggesting you use operant conditioning at all, uh, uh, nor am I suggesting you use surveillance technology necessarily. Um, so sometimes a suggestion technology can produce the desired effect. Um, you don't need to have surveillance technology. Uh, a gentler suggestion could be the right thing. Um, sometimes you have to use more than one of these tools, but this is like my disclaimer to say, I'm not telling you to go out there and hypnotize people with digital social media and get them to make decisions they're going to regret. Um, the idea of surveillance, the idea of conditioning um, uh, when used covertly doesn't have any persuasive effect. Um, if, if the pigeons pecking was just being written down by somebody and they, the pigeon wasn't aware that there was that ob observation, the pigeon's behavior would never have changed. Uh, the pigeon would just have been randomly doing things. It was the fact the pigeon was aware it was being observed. There was an effect um, that, over, that overt surveillance is how you use surveillance correctly to get behavior. Um, there are some flaws to this. There are some ways that even uh, ethical surveillance can become unethical. For example, there are some f issues with the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in the use of surveillance and the way uh, that can make mistakes, not just uh, about actions, but about the very race or identity of individuals. Uh, and this, that's well documented. Um, but it's also the reason why if you've ever been in an airport bathroom and you see the thing is, were you satisfied with the, how sanitary this bathroom was? Uh, it's a big thing with a smiley face or not a smiley face and you hit it. It's because they want folks to know that it's being watched. It may not be watched, but you think the bathroom's cleaner because you got to hit that button. Um, some of you may think surveillance is justified. Some of you may not. I think opinion is divided on the subject, um, but it really does speak to the idea of conditioning technology. Um, the idea that by watching individuals and by simulating behavior uh, after observation, you can change or simulate uh, simulating uh, operating stimulus can change behavior. I'm going to give you an example here uh, of another kind of conditioning technology. This is one of my favorites. It's a quick TED talk here. Uh, these are capuchin monkeys, um, which I love. But this is going to talk a bit about how conditioning can change behaviors. And watch what happens to this monkey when the conditioned behavior is changed. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah. Sorry. Sorry about that. Got you all excited, and then I cut it off. Okay, here we go again. So, I brought and we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes as a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she 
she tests her rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. So, yeah, uh, jokes about uh, finance aside, uh, the idea there was that the monkeys were conditioned to think this is what happens. I do this and this is what happens. But then if you see somebody else getting something else, it's very unfair. The reaction, even with a capuchin monkey, uh, the, their condition reaction is just that's not the way things are supposed to be. So that deeply ingrained. Computer games do this for us. They uh, condition behavior all the time. They shape complex behaviors. Um, digital social media shape complex behaviors. Think about how many times your picture taking, your composition of a tweet is shaped by the social media platform, just as we've talked about with all your, your uh, creative content assignments. Um, the goal of these games is somewhat similar to digital social media. It's to get folks obsessed. They're just not creating content. Uh, they're trying to pursue a goal. That goal is advancement, advancement with visuals and sounds and ranks and things. And, and in many cases, it is social. There is a social component. So there's a prestige mode there. There's an interactivity. There's a, a gathering with folks in the metaverse or in digital spaces uh, that, that comes along with this. So uh, complex behaviors are shaped by persuasive technology. Um, it's amazing what conditioning can do. Um, it's amazing what simple communications can do. When you think about the fact that that uh, conditioning and technology can get a dolphin to train up, jump out of the water, uh, getting human beings to do things with digital social media is not that hard. Um, think about the persuasive ability of, of just email. The idea of sharing a document uh, is persuasive. The idea of having a calendar that can schedule appointments is persuasive. Technology itself and the reduction uh, strategies that these tools employ are persuasive. So don't assume just because it's something that makes our lives easier, it isn't persuasive. It absolutely is. So um, if you think about these, I'm, I'm going to sum up here and then I'll take questions, but uh, you think about these seven types of tools and, and, and how many uh, uh, you've seen in uh, apps or social media platforms that you use. I'm sure you've seen them other places as well. Um, think about these as you work on your final project. Uh, but uh, when thinking about the power of moments and constructing powerful moments using digital social media, these are additional tools that you can consider uh, when trying to uh, shape the behaviors of your users. So any questions? There are questions later. I'm happy to take them via email. Um, I'll send this recording out to folks as well, so you have it. Um, but any questions about anything I mentioned tonight?